This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keeling in Gloucester, England, finding out what's being done to save a critically endangered species vital to the health of European rivers. And I'm Shini Somara, finding out what blood snow tells us about climate change. You can see the power in it. Staring into the murky current, we're awaiting the arrival of one of the oldest species on Earth. We're on the banks of the River Severn. It forms part of the border between England and Wales, and it's 11 o'clock at night. Believe it or not, this is the perfect time to go fishing for a critically endangered species, the European eel. Now, you might be squirming yourself, thinking, oh, those slippery black characters, but the health of European rivers depends on them. It's a 100 million year old enigma that keeps fishermen like Jason Sparrow guessing. So what are the numbers like that, you, that you're getting right now, Jason? So probably about 30. And is that a, a, a good dip, as you call it? I'd like more, but I'm not going to complain because I'm catching something. Eel numbers have been declining for hundreds of years, with a marked acceleration between 1980 and 2010, seeing numbers across Europe plummet by as much as 95%. So how many generations of your family have, have been coming out here on the River Obviously, Center? my dad, I can always remember my granddad doing it, and my great-granddad used to do it. So four generations. Over 300 UK licences are still available for a regulated fishing season. Because each year, you know, you get a lot of new people doing it. You know, they hear about the few quid you can earn. So they're like, let's get in on that. Yeah. So maybe, you know, they should cut the licences. 60% of the catch used to be sold to exporters for around 150 to 200 pounds a kilo for restocking. The other 40% could be sold for consumption for a premium price. But the new Brexit trade deal has stopped export of the 10 to 15 million eels that used to go to Europe. Now the market's wiped out, some fishermen and women have chosen to volunteer their time to restock within the UK. And does it feel good to be Sort of restocking them, putting oh, something yeah, definitely. back. Oh yeah, yeah. It's always put good to put something back. You can't keep take, 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 take. Yeah. All eels caught tonight are brought together to recuperate before being released, but their chances of survival are slim. The long-term consequences of Brexit are also unknown, and organised crime has a multi-billion-dollar black market to feed. So, what next for the European eel? Morning on the River Severn. I've been joined by Andrew Carr, Chairman of the Sustainable Eel Group, or SEG. Nice crisp morning. Yeah. I'm just looking at the bank there. Is that how high up it yeah, comes? that's right. I'm about to see a natural phenomenon known as the Severn Bore. I'm starting to get a little bit excited because it's, it's close now, isn't it? Yeah, we'll, it'll be here in 10 minutes is my guess. The bore is formed when the rising tide moves into the Bristol Channel and Severn Estuary, which forces the water upstream, hopefully bringing with it millions of glass eels. This is the second greatest tidal range in the world. And uh, this tidal stream that we call the Severn Bore is the perfect free ride for the elvers up the River Severn. They're surfing it, basically. They're surfers. They're the, they're the original surfing dudes. <laughs> I can hear it coming. That's that's the ball. Oh yes, you can see hear that roar in the background. That's it coming down. That's it, you. Know, two or three hundred meters away. Wow. Today it's more of a surge than some of the spectacular waves seen before, but you can see the water rise many meters in minutes. This occurs twice a day at certain times of the year and is associated with the full moon. The glass seals begin to arrive around February, 
peak in April and can continue until June. And so where have they come from to, to be here in the Seven? Thank you. The, the eel's life cycle is extraordinarily complex. Mm. It, it's a very long-lived species. And we think it starts in the Sargasso Sea at the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, sounds now, ominous. <laughs> this, is not never... a this is not a great place to be born. <laughs> <laughs> the odds are never on the eel's side. Eels begin life as eggs in the North Atlantic Sargasso Sea. It's thought they drift as larvae for about one to two years, covering 4,000 miles northeast in the Gulf Stream. On the journey, they morph into leaf-shaped leptocephalus to catch the current, and it's thought only 1% of the eggs survive. As they approach the freshwater rivers of Europe and the UK, they evolve into glass eels, which make their way upriver using the tides. Over a period of weeks, they become darker in colour and are called elvers. They'll spend around 5 to 25 years there, which is most of their adult life, and grow up to a metre long. They develop into the adult stage of the yellow eel first, before finally transforming into silver eels when they start to become reproductively mature and swim back to the Sargasso Sea. There they spawn and die. The females definitely get the worst deal. They're literally, the females, are you know, a million eggs a kilo and a big female is two or three kilos. Shush! And by the time she arrives, the scientists tell me, she's 85% eggs, absolutely <laughs> shattered. She's just a vehicle for carrying. I bet there's a lot of feminist eels out there. <laughs> They're <laughs> fed up. <laughs> yeah. Eels play a huge role in ecosystems as scavengers, eating such things as mosquito larvae and dead fish. And they, in turn, are eaten by bigger fish, birds and otters. They're not as cuddly as a panda, but keep the balance in freshwater environments. Andrew and the SEG are attempting a common environmental juggle, trying to accelerate the eel recovery while keeping the traditions alive and support the local economy in a sustainable way. And fishermen, or elvermen as they are called, are a big part of the plan. People might be sitting at home and saying, well, hang on, why are you fishing an endangered species? Well, the thing about fishing for them is you can assist their migration over the barrier. So you're, you're giving them a, a human-assisted 10, 20, 30-mile ride and then releasing them, and you know, modern language, we're calling it rewilding, we're rewilding them above these barriers. And this assistance will reduce the mortality substantially. These barriers are the weirs, floodgates, locks and hydropowered stations that block the glass eels' migration all the way upriver. There's been a 93% decline in freshwater migratory fish in the UK and Europe. A study by Swansea University estimates that 99% of the UK's rivers are fragmented by barriers and sluice gates like this that stop eels moving from the river to the wetlands. Look at that view. It's gorgeous, isn't it? A proper wilderness. But is it really a wilderness? <laughs> Look at the human engineering. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so is this the great, one of these things? Are these the greatest threat to the eel? A huge threat, yeah. Andrew tells me that in the surrounding 20 miles of the Severn, there are a couple of hundred barriers. In total, the UK has around 100,000. And on the continent, a report by the Amber Barrier Atlas concludes there could be well over a million. It's turned into the biggest killer of all. By stopping the migration, eel mortality goes through the roof. And this has led WWF in the Global Planet report to say the most degraded habitat on the planet is not your Amazon rainforest or anywhere else. It's here in Europe and it's our rivers and wetlands. The wetlands are vital for eels, and Andrew says around three quarters of them have been drained in Europe and the UK, mostly in the last 50 years. This area historically would have been a wetland, a marshland, mm -hmm. perfect eel habitat, and they've been drained. So it's just a, another example of a, a loss of, of habitat for the eel? Yes. Wetlands are the most important habitat for eel. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make this metamorphosis from a sea saltwater fish mm -hmm. to a freshwater fish. 
And this transition is as big as changing from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And already we have a mortality rate here at this phase of something like 90%. Oh. So if you take the wetlands away, even, you know, the mortality goes through the roof. They are still very abundant, but nothing to what they were. But even if the eels make it back to safety where they can grow, when they reach maturity, they'll have to battle through the barriers all over again to get back to the Sargasso Sea. So what's stopping you from sending the, these eels around the UK? Is it a, a lack of funding or a lack of fishermen, or is it too many rules stopping you from doing that? Yeah, it's money, someone's got to pay for it. And there are rules, but the rules can be met. They surround biosecurity and issues like that, but we can meet those. But there's another, more menacing threat that's harder to deal with. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. European glass eel numbers have been decimated over the decades and organisations like the Sustainable Eel Group are trying to turn that around. But another group is undermining a lot of the good work, organised crime. Measured on the basis of profit by weight, eel smuggling is more lucrative than trafficking cocaine. It has been estimated over three billion US dollars worth of glass eels are being smuggled every year. The 150 to 200 pounds a kilo a fisherman can make on UK riverbanks can become thousands when sold illegally to Asian markets. That's what people forget is how much organised crime is behind the eel trade. Eels have taken up most of Ian Guilford's time in his role with the UK Wildlife Crime Unit. So ourselves, France, Spain, um, etc., looking into this illegal trade, um, working with Europol, but it expanded, to be fair. We now um, work with countries all across the world. Seafood salesman Gilbert Koo was found guilty of smuggling an estimated £53 million worth of live eels out of the UK. So they're not only smuggling them out in, in containers, I've heard they're also putting them in suitcases and taking them on aeroplanes. Basically, you're finding that uh, people are being paid to come over, they're going into Spain, they're being equipped with suitcases, um, then the, they go to the holding area where these the glass eels have been stored for a short period just to settle them. They're then put into like plastic bags, aerated, a bit like your goldfish uh, at a fair. And it's just taken on board a commercial flight, booked in as normal baggage. 48 hours, 40, 48 hours maximum, you'll get a high return of live glass eels at the other end. And I guess the finger's always being pointed at the fishermen because everybody thinks, well, they're the ones that are making the money. It's like any area of criminality. It's a small minority that are abusing it and they can see there's money to be made from it and it's opportunists. Andrew is trying to show people what can be gained from restocking eel populations. Today, he's brought together eel fishermen and other supporters to celebrate the release of 100,000 glass eels caught by fishermen further downriver. The goal is to release over 2 million further upstream past barriers before the end of the fishing season. A magical day though today with the, with the alvermen, yeah. getting them on side with you. Was that a, sort of an important moment to sort of get them into the release program? Yes, it, very important. We've always had a few, but one of the successes of this program is it's reached out to others who were very suspicious of us. And there is a lot of distrust and a history of distrust. Um, it, there's a book and a story on it called The Victorian Elver Wars. It goes back a long, long time. So. Yeah, collaborative leadership. We're trying to build links for a joined up agenda. You need them on your side. We do. They are part of the solution. A 
another part are fish passes, structures large and small built beside weirs and other barriers to enable migratory fish and eels to move upriver. In 2020, we visited the construction site of the Douglas Weir Fish Pass in Worcester with Jenny Hermely from the Canal River Trust, who's seen firsthand the almost impossible task fish face. I was here a few weeks ago, probably eight weeks ago, watching salmon attempting to cross this weir. And it was heartbreaking, I think, actually seeing them trying and really powering up towards the weir crest and then slipping back down and making any number of attempts. This pass is one of four to be built by several partners involved in the Unlocking the Seven project. Eels are actually quite affected if there's too many eels concentrated in one place. They don't want to be in competition with each other. They don't want to be a big group of eels that attracts predators. So they want to spread out from each other. And when they hit a barrier like this, they have a problem because it's much more difficult for them to disperse and access a much wider range of habitat. So eels will tend to come up uh, the sides of the river, clinging to the, the habitats on the side. Um, so some of them will find our fish pass and they will uh, be able to negotiate the low flow parts of the fish pass, which is great. This is the biggest deep vertical slot pass in England and Wales. It needs to be this big because of the species they're targeting, such as twait shad and salmon. It's hoped eels will also use the pass. Richard Harrison is my concrete tour guide. So Richard, so this is where they, so they come up river and then yep. what, this will be a, an open space there with the Yeah, so they, so they come up river, they'll typically work their way across, across the weir. So we're, we're quite fortunate the way the weir's angled here, so they'll, they'll naturally want to work their way to the entrance to the fish pass. So it's 100 metres long, is that right? 100 metres long, 8 metres wide, 8 metres deep. <laughs> yeah. Let's go down, Let's I want to see down. this 8 metres deep bit. <laughs> You're going to fit a lot of fish in here, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Ready for the whales to come in. Apparently it'll fit 36 blue whales. Oh, yeah. now that's that's a good stat to have for, <laughs> for Christmas parties. I feel like we're going downhill. Is that right? We are going downhill at the moment. Okay. And it'll be, which will effectively be uphill for the fish because they'll be working their way through the fish pass in that okay. way. Okay. So the, what each of these areas is, is slightly stepped down, so they're going to be stepped up. Why haven't you just got one big long chute? So behind us here, we've got a two metre plus high weir. So in the fish, the way that the dynamics of how the fish will work is the rear can only go up certain gradients at a time, which is why we've got here a sequence of 11 pools in total. And each one's got a, a gradient gain of about uh, 200 millimetres okay. to roughly correspond with the height of the weir to enable them to slowly move, work their way through um, and not have too much flow, which will uh, prevent them from working their way through the fish mm -hmm. pass. So all these shapes are designed so that they are, they, these are fish friendly shapes, are yes, they? Yes, specifically <laughs> designed that way, yeah. So, we have a, an angled runoff here, so it's designed so the, the water will flow through the fish pass. It'll hit this angle, and it's designed to come, come in, and you'll see this behind here is the, uh, it's, it's called a C-section, a and it's shaped in a C, and the water will it'll hit that C-section, and that breaks up the energy and the flow, dissipates energy, and then sends the water back round. And the fish, as they work their way through, so they'll, there's one of these slots on either side, so there's one here and one just over there. It's about half a metre wide, and then the intention is in each pool, the fish can take a short breather. So normally behind this section, this is known as the nib section, so they'll typically have a bit of a bit of a breather in here. It might be a few hours, could be less, and then they work their way into the next pool and gradually work their way through, uh, through to the top end of the fish pass. Months later, thanks to a few pandemic delays, we're back to see Jenny. So the fish pass is open, but are there any fish? Well, I'm very pleased to report that, yes, we definitely have fish already using the fish pass. We don't expect to see the eels very often. They will be creeping along the stones in the bottom of the pass. And how long will it take before you know how successful this has been? Well, I think the real success will come over the very long term because what we're trying to do is reconnect fish to their historic spawning grounds. So it will take a number of generations to see the benefit of that, to see really vibrant populations of these migratory fish back on the river. But in the meantime, we have lots of ways that we're monitoring. We've actually tagging Twait Shad at the moment down in Tewkesbury where you were earlier, and we'll be able to monitor them from acoustic tagging um, as they approach the pass, as they move up the river, 
and we even fit another kind of tag that specifically um, monitors them as they move through this pass so we can see how they interact with the structure. Fantastic. So, so far, so successful. Exactly, yeah. It may feel like a lot of fuss and money over a few fish and eels, but as the world wakes up to what we're doing to our oceans, people like Andrew are working hard to make sure our fresh water environments get the attention they deserve too. And slowly but surely, it seems the efforts to increase glass eel numbers are working. This is a very precarious spot, but it's a very privileged spot because I am going to release about 3,000 of these little glass eels. And we've given them a lift up the hill by about, uh, or up the stream I should say, well, by about 12 miles. And um, it means that they don't have to go through all those other barriers. So it's just a, a little less sort of hard work that they have to, to do. So we'll just tip a few in here and let them go. Woo, look at them all, amazing. There we go. And they're off. <laughs> oh, amazing. Good luck. Go forth. Multiply. Can we get them off that um, endangered list? This is the goal. It's not just the list. It's, it's much more that their numbers increase again. We can show it through measurement. Um, the graph is going up. OK, it's not going up like that yet, but it's going up steadily. But it's not going to be solved in my lifetime. This is a multi-decadal journey. For more science, behind the scenes insights, groundbreaking research and even some fun, check out our Razor podcast. Search Razor Sounds on all major streaming platforms and remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on any episodes. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Antarctica is truly on the front line of climate change. Scientists based there are able to observe the fluctuations in the weather and the changing landscape close up. So when the snow began to turn an apocalyptic blood red around the Ukraine's Verdansky research station, they were in a unique position to solve the mystery. This is the place where these changes are rapid, where they are visible. The ice is melting and it's actually what is happening, what we can see at our station. I have been working there for three years only, but I can already say that uh, when I was there for my first time, everything was covered with snow for the whole summer. Whereas now, uh, during the last two years, the snow is melting and there is a lot of exposed rocks. So yeah, the environment is changing now. So what is the specific focus of the Verdansky research base? Because it's a small little green hut in the middle of nowhere. Is there a particular area that they want to focus on in terms of research? Uh, previously, when it was uh, the British station, because it previously belonged to British Antarctic Survey, and then was presented to Ukraine, because we had uh, enough research capabilities at that time, when the focus was mainly on meteorological research, on ozone layer research. The hole in the ozone layer was actually discovered at this research station in 1985, and the station continues to monitor ongoing weather and climate patterns. More recently, though, biologists such as Maria have had a place there as the study of Antarctic biota has come to the forefront of climate science. We study plants, microbes, algae, uh, birds, uh, whales, and we are trying to focus on their response to the changes that are ongoing in this region. The red snow, a recent phenomenon, was something that the scientists at the station couldn't miss. What exactly is happening in Antarctica that is creating this dramatic visual effect? 
It's called Chlamydomonada nivalis. It's a very scientific Latin name. Uh, but basically, this is a very, very small single-celled algae. And uh, when they just start developing, they are green. But then they get this red color. This is actually the response to the extreme Antarctic environment that we see, this, like, the bloody color. They like to be in snow because they're specifically adapted to it, but the higher temperatures, the more active the biochemical processes are. Therefore, these two processes are connected to more sun, more warming, and that's what gives benefits to them. Is that an indication of climate change? This bloom they can be actually one of the indicators of warming, but we can't be sure what is the speed of this warming and uh, we can't say a lot about it. We, we are just observing what is happening in order to be able to make some models. The algae blooms are alarming purely because of the color. Should we be alarmed? Um, I'm not sure if we should be alarmed by this because actually this algae, they are not only the bad sign. Uh, well, they are connected with some warming for sure, but they are important for this ecosystem because these algae, they are food for other creatures. So maybe the ecosystem itself will be also adapting to these changes. Actually, our planet was constantly adapting to some changes. We can hope that this uh, bloom will actually create another community of uh, small creatures feeding on it, so that that can become just the part of the trophic web of the Antarctica. Another sign that the temperature is rising is a colony of Gentoo penguins. They prefer warm weather and have made the island their home since 2007. The colony has since grown to around 4,000 birds. Penguins prefer it a uh, warmer environment. But now, when it is uh, gradually becoming warmer in our region, the penguins started to inhabit our island, and now there are hundreds of them. And this is also one of the indicators of some changes happening around. The penguins' arrival is also connected to the increase in blood snow. The organic matter from the colony is mixing in with the meltwater and feeding the algal bloom. In fact, the researchers are concerned that a feedback loop of warming, melting and blooming could occur because the red colouring on the snow reflects less sunlight, meaning the ice will warm more rapidly. I actually think that we might see less and less snow there. And the big ice cap that is covering our island has broken down this year. So we think there will be less ice and less snow. Uh, the algal bloom uh, will be still there until there will be snow and ice. I think it will happen each year now. Even though the blood-coloured algae blooms and other signs point to a fundamental change going on, Maria remains optimistic and stresses the importance of recording the changes taking place and sharing the findings with scientists worldwide. The science now is different from the science of the 18th or 19th century, you know, because at that time you could just work on your small object on your own and you would be fine. But now you need to study the problem that is globally important and compare and share your data. So a lot of resources is invested now in having harmonized protocols so that you can clearly compare the data collected uh, in different, very, very remote areas. You know, you can't make any normal assumptions about the climate just studying some problem for one year or for two years. You need to focus on it for many years and while you're working, you make small discoveries that might lead you to the big discovery someday. Your research sounds so fascinating and uh, thank you for kind of the work you do um, in those very extreme conditions. And oddly, I'm both worried about the future, but somehow hopeful that maybe this is about our climate changing rather than things heading towards catastrophe. The fundamental science is something that invests in the future. If we get the information so we can at least make some forecasts and then we will have some time to adapt. Our world will be changing all the time. It will not stay the same. And uh, what we need is some tools to be able to adapt on time. <laughs>